Hello, my name is Maria Colgan, and welcome to our session on managing Oracle Database in Memory. Oracle Database in Memory is the introduction of a new in-memory column store into the Oracle Database. It's going to allow you to populate data in memory in a column format and have your queries automatically take advantage of that column format. What types of queries would those be? They're typically analytical style queries, queries that are going to scan a lot of data, apply some where clause predicates or filters to that data, and return a subset of rows. The Oracle Optimizer is fully aware of this new in-memory column store and will automatically direct the queries that will benefit from it to the column store. It does not replace the existing row format in memory that we've always had, or the buffer cache, and we'll explain how these two environments co are co-located in the Oracle database as we go through the presentation today. The column format is purely in memory. It's not persisted on disk in any way, so nothing changes in terms of the disk capacity required to host your database when you use the in-memory column store. We'll talk as through the session today about how you control which objects get populated into the column store and how you know whether or not your query is going to access the column store. So I'm going to begin today's session by talking a little bit about how you can configure the column store, what initialization parameters need to change, and what things you need to bear in mind when it comes to allocating a column store in your environment. The in-memory column store is a new component or pool inside of the SGA or the shared global area of your database. The in-memory column store is a static pool, which means it will not grow or shrink during the lifetime of the database. When you're allocating the total SGA using the SGA target parameter, you need to ensure that it's large enough to encompass the existing components within the SGA, things like the buffer cache, the shared pool, as well as the new in-memory area. You can specify the size of your in-memory area by using the new in-memory size parameter. If you look in $SGA, you'll see that new pool and how much memory from your total SGA has been allocated to that pool. Remember, it is a static pool, which means it is not controlled or managed using the new automatic memory management algorithm that was introduced in 11G. It is a static pool, which means it will neither grow nor shrink over the lifetime of the database. So you want to make sure when you're specifying your in-memory size that you make it large enough to, ac to accommodate all of the objects you need in the column store. You also need to remember that the SGA target is set large enough to accommodate that new in-memory area as well as all the other existing components in your SGA. So I want to move on now and talk about how we decide what objects should go into that column store and how those objects will be populated in memory. You get to decide which objects you want to populate into the column store, and those objects are going to be compressed as they're being populated. I'm going to explain now, as we go through this presentation, exactly when the objects will be populated and how much compression is going to be used on each of those objects. So who gets to decide what objects should be populated into the column store? Well, you as the DBA get to decide what objects should be populated into the column store. You can either specify the new in-memory attribute at a table, partition, subpartition, or materialize view. That new in-memory attribute can be specified simply by saying alter table sales in memory. If you want to remove an object from the column store, you simply say alter table sales, no in-memory. Because you have the ability to specify the in-memory attribute at a segment level, so either a partition or a subpartition, you can have an object that only has your performance sensitive data in the column store while the rest of the object resides on disk. You can do this by specifying a different in-memory attribute um, on each of the partitions in that object. When a query comes in to access that object, we'll pick up the data from wherever it resides, whether that's the column store or disk or a combination of both. Are there any objects that can't be populated into the column store? Well, there are just a couple. The IOTs and hash clusters, both of which are more OLTP-focused uh, features, do not get populated into the column store. 
The reason being is that these structures typically enhance access to an individual record in the database rather than an analytical style query that's going to access lots of rows in the database. So they're not really useful to be put in the column store. The other component or object that doesn't always get populated into the column store is a lob column. Lob columns are typically used to allow you to put unstructured data into the Oracle database. And they come in two forms, an inline lob and an out of line lob. An inline lob is one that's 4K or less in size and is stored co-located with the other column values of a particular row. Those inline lobs will be populated into the column store when the other rows and the other columns of that table are being populated into the column store. An out-of-line lob, on the other hand, is a lob that is greater than 4K in size and is stored separately from, its, uh, from the other columns in that row. Those out-of-line lobs or larger lobs are not populated into the column store. We believe that they'll waste a lot of space and they're frequently not accessed along with the rest of the columns. So if you mark a table that's got a lob column in memory, then we'll populate any inline lobs automatically into the column store along with the other column values for that table. But we'll exclude any out of line lobs when we're doing that population. It'll happen automatically for you. So if you forget and you mark a table in memory that has a only out of line lobs, we'll automatically exclude that column and populate all of the others into the column store. Not all of the columns in all of the tables need to be populated into the column store. You do have the ability to exclude some of the columns from a table during the population. You're able to do that by simply doing alter table sales in memory, no in memory, open parenthesis and give us a comma delimited list of the columns you don't wish to have be populated in memory. That is going to allow you to save space in the column store by not having the frequently accessed columns be populated into the column store. You also get to control when the objects get populated into the column store. You're going to do this by specifying a priority attribute on the objects. There are five priority attributes that you can specify, critical being the most important, high, medium, low, and none. None is the default, and that means the objects are only populated into the column store on first access. If you specify any of the other priorities on an object, then when the database starts up, we will process the objects that need to be populated into the column store in a prioritized list, starting with the most critical objects first, then the high objects with a high priority, medium priority, and low priority until all of the objects that have been marked with the in-memory priority have been populated into the in-memory column store. By default, all of the objects populated in the in-memory column store are going to be compressed. They're going to use a new type of compression technique that's different from the compression techniques we've used to date in the Oracle database. These compression techniques are focused on performance, and by that I mean query performance. So these new compression algorithms allow us to be able to apply the WHERE clause predicates or filter predicates directly on the compressed data. By default, you're getting mem compress for query. That's what it's called. But you can change that if you wish. You can change the types of compression that's used on the objects in the column store by specifying a different mem compress attribute when you're uh, either altering or creating an object. You've got five choices for the different types of compression we have, all the way starting from no compression whatsoever to compress for DML, compress for query, low and high, and compress for capacity, low and high. Compress for capacity is going to allow you to use a higher level of compression to get more data into the column store. There is a slight gotcha by using mem compress Capaci for capacity though, because it will require additional CPU to decompress some of the data before applying your WHERE clause predicates to that data. So it will allow you to save space, but it comes with the payment of requiring additional CPU when you query it. So when you are populating the objects in the column store, you need to bear in mind that trade-off between saving space and getting a great compression ratio and being able to apply the WHERE clause predicates of your queries efficiently against the data stored 
in the column store. You do have the uh, option to specify a different compression technique for different columns within a single object and of course a different compression technique on all the different objects that are stored in the in-memory column store should you wish. How do I know which tables are marked in memory and for in memory and which are not? Well, there's a new in memory column in user underscore tables. You'll see there that it, this column is a Boolean. It's either enabled or disabled. In this example here, the products table has been enabled for the column store. Now, you heard me say there that this is a Boolean column that either has one of two values enabled or disabled. So why do two of the tables listed here have no value specified whatsoever? Both the costs and the sales table are partitioned tables. That means that the table level or the partition table is just a logical object. The actual physical object that has the in-memory attribute specified on it are the underlying partitions or subpartitions of those objects. So if you want to see whether or not those individual partitions have been marked for in memory, you'd need to look at user tab, uh, part, part, user tab partitions or user tab subpartitions to see the in memory attribute specified on those underlying physical objects. How do I know if an object has been populated into the column store or is being populated into the column store? You can see that by looking in a new V$ view called V$ IM segments. It has a status column in that new view that will tell you whether or not the object has completed population and is in the column store, or it can tell you if the object has been started. Objects that, are being st that have, have a start status means they're in the middle of population right now. There is an additional column in this view called bytes not populated that will indicate to you how much more is of that object is left to be populated into the column store. Once it, that column reaches zero, then the status will change from started to completed. So now you know how to get data into the column store and you know how to size the column store, but how much space do you really need? How well are your particular objects going to compress when you run mem compress on them? Well, you can find out by running the compression advisor. The compression advisor has been extended in Oracle Database 12C to make it mem compress aware. So you'll be able to run the compression advisor just as you do today by calling DBMS compression and specifying the new mem compress attributes there um, and have it tell you what compression ratio you can expect for your objects if, should they be populated into the in-memory column store. If you're not sure which objects you want to populate into the column store, there is a new in-memory advisor. It will look at your existing AWR and ASH repositories and determine, based on the information we find there, which objects would be good candidates for the column store. It's going to give you a prioritized list of those objects, let you know what kind of performance benefit we believe you'll get by populating those objects into the column store, and it will also tell you what kind of compression we believe you'll get for those objects. So I want to move on now and talk about how you know if your queries are benefiting from the in-memory column store. I wanted to take a moment to refresh your memories on why it is scanning data in the column store is so much more efficient than scanning that exact data in buffer cache. After all, both sets of data are in memory. Why is the row format not as efficient as the column format when it comes to scanning an awful lot of data from a small set of columns? Take, for example, our query here. I'm looking for an individual column in the table, in this case, column four, and my table has been populated in memory in the row format into the buffer cache. When this query begins, we'll need to find the offset for the first row in that table. We'll walk down that row until we find the fourth column. We'll extract the value that we're interested in, and we'll move to the offset of the next row and so forth until we've scanned all of the rows in the table, returning the values just for column four. If we were to execute the same query against the table in a column format, this is what you'd see. Inside in the column store, each of the columns in the table is being stored separately. So we go directly to column four, we don't scan any additional information, and we're able to get all of the values that we want 
directly from column four. There's another component to this, of course, is that the data in the column store is compressed. So the volume of data we're actually scanning in column four is a lot less than it would be scanning the same column in the column or in the buffer cache in the row format. So we're getting several advantages there, only access the data we're interested in and access that data in a compressed format. But there are some other advantages to scanning data in the column store as well. One of those advantages is the fact that each of the columns in the in-memory column store actually has something called a storage index created on it. That storage index is keeping track of the min-max values for each of the extents or IMCUs within that column. We're able to use that storage index to provide data pruning or data elimination as part of the scan. So in other words, we'll check the value that we're looking for against that min-max uh, range for each of the IMCUs in that column, and we will only scan the IMCUs where we find a match. So say, for example, I'm looking for the store IDs where the store ID is eight or higher. I'll look at the first extent or IMCU in this column. I'll see that I don't have any store IDs that are eight or higher, so I'm not going to even bother scanning that uh, component or extent of this column. I'll skip it. I'll move on to the second one. It also has no entries that are eight or higher, so I'll skip that also. I'll move on to the third IMCU in the column. I find that I do have the potential to find a match for a store ID eight or higher, so I will scan that particular IMCU and I'll move on and do the same for the fourth, because again, it has the potential to have some values with store ID eight or higher. By getting data elimination or not scanning data, we're able to improve the scan performance by again, reducing the amount of data that needs to be scanned as part of this query. We have one final component to speed up the scan performance in the in-memory column store, and that's SIMD vector processing, or single instruction multiple data points or data values. SIMD vector processing, processing is not new, it certainly wasn't invented by Oracle, it's actually been around since the late 60s, early 70s with the introduction of supercomputing. It's also used an awful lot in uh, computer-generated animation. SIMD vector processing is going to allow us to apply the WHERE clause predicate to a set of values from a column ra uh, rather than trying to uh, apply that WHERE clause predicate to one entry at a time. By allowing us to do this array processing or set processing within a single CPU instruction, we're able to scan billions of rows per second per core instead of the tens of millions of rows per second that we can scan in the buffer cache today. So how do I know if my query is benefiting from the in-memory column store? You can tell by looking at the execution plan for that query. Instead of seeing table access full as you would today, you'll now see table access in memory full to indicate that some or all of the data from that table was accessed via the column store. You can disable the use of the column store either at a session or statement level by using the new init.ora parameter in memory query. Simply setting that to false will disable the use of the column store and force the optimizer to choose a row-based execution for that particular query. How do you know whether or not all of the data is coming from the column store or just part of it? You can look at a new set of session statistics that we've introduced as part of the in-memory column store. You'll recognize these new in-memory statistics as they all begin with IM for in-memory. By looking at those session statistics, you'll be able to see how much your individual session is benefiting from the column store. Those statistics, of course, are rolled up at the uh, system level and are visible in your AWR reports as well. So analytical style queries that are going to benefit from the column store do a lot more than simply scan and filter data. They're also going to require joins. And we're able to make joins incredibly efficient in the column store by converting the joins into a filter predicate that will be applied as part of the scan of the larger table, allowing us to take advantage of what the column store is good at, filtering data. 
The technique we use to convert joints to filters is not new. It's called Bloom Filters, and it was actually originally introduced into the database in Oracle Database 10G. So here's how it works. Let's take a simple example where we're looking for the total amount of sales we had on Christmas Eve last year. That's a two-table join between the date column, or sorry, the date dimension and the sales table. We're going to begin the query by scanning the date dimension first, and we're only going to look at the column that we've got a where clause predicate on. So we're going to scan the date column of the date dimension, and for each entry that we find as a match to our where clause predicate, we'll pick up the corresponding date key value. That's going to be the join column between the date dimension and the sales table. Based on that join date key column, we'll create a new filter predicate that will be applied to the sales table as part of the scan. So as we scan that table, we'll apply that filter predicate. And for each date key that matches, we will pick up the corresponding amount for that sale. So by the time we complete the scan, we'll actually have the total amount of sales we made on Christmas Eve. How do I know I'm getting a Bloom filter for a particular query? Well, I know by looking at the execution plan. If we look at this execution plan between the date dimension and the line orders table, you'll see there that this plan actually starts on line four with a scan of the date dimension table. You'll see right above that that the, uh, we are doing a Bloom filter create. That's the creation of the filter predicate, which is then used on line five of the plan as part of the scan of the line orders table. So that's how I know I'm getting a Bloom filter. It's obvious right there in the execution plan for the query. But what if I had a more complex query, one that had multiple table joins and one that had multiple tables all joining to that large fact table? Can I still take advantage of multiple Bloom filters in this case, or can I only get one? Well, because you're dealing with an optimizer that has been evolving over the last 30 years, over 12 different releases of the database, we are able to take advantage of some of the base query transformations that that optimizer has in order to rewrite your query and generate a Bloom filter for each of those join predicates. Now, why would that be important? By taking advantage of the fact that the Oracle optimizer has in fact been around for over 30 years and has evolved over the last 12 versions of the database, we're able to use some existing optimizer transformations to rewrite the query in order to generate a Bloom filter for each of those join predicates. By building a Bloom filter for each join predicate, we're able to filter out or eliminate as much of the data from the large fact table or the line order table right at the beginning of the execution plan rather than having to carry a large amount of data throughout the different joins in that execution plan, making it a much more efficient way to join all of these tables together. And of course, as you can see, you can tell whether or not you get multiple Bloom filters by looking at the execution plan. So analytical queries still do more than simply scan and join. They also need to do some aggregation or summation of the data. And we're able to do that very efficiently in the in-memory column store by not only converting the joins as filters that are used as part of the scan of the, of the large table, but also by converting the group by so that we can also do that as part of the scan of the sales table. We're able to do that by taking advantage of something called vector group by, which is a new type of group by introduced in Oracle Database 12C. Let's take a look at an example of this in action. We're looking for all of the sales we've had for our different footwear products across our outlet stores. That's a three table join between the stores, product, and sales table. And we're gonna begin this query by scanning the two dimension tables first. Now, when we scan those tables, we're only going to access the columns we need for this query. And then using that information, we're going to do two things. We're gonna build the join vectors, just as we did before, that's going to allow us to do the join as part of the scan of the sales table, but we're also going to build an in-memory accumulator or report. You can visualize this multi-dimensional array a bit like a spreadsheet. 
across the top of your spreadsheet, you've got the different types of products. Down the left-hand side, the different stores. As we begin the scan of the sales table, we'll use the vectors that we created to complete the joins. In other words, only pick up information from the sales table where the product type is equal to footwear and the store is equal to outlet. As we do that scan and we pick up that information, we'll fill in the corresponding cell on the spreadsheet for that particular product and that particular store. So by the time we complete the query, we'll actually have completed the spreadsheet and we'll already have the total sales by product by store type. So we simply need to return that multidimensional array and any other payload columns required by the query to answer the query. We no longer have to do the aggregation right at the end of the query after we've already done the joins. So it's going to make it much more efficient for us to aggregate large sets of data that will roll up into a small number of values. How do you know if you're getting or taking advantage of this vector group by? Well, you'll see it in the execution plan. A lot of queries that in previous releases would have used a hash group by will now use a vector group by in the execution plan. And you'll be able to clearly see that whether you use the command line to generate your execution plans or if you take advantage of SQL Monitor. So I'd like to move on now and talk a little bit about how you manage data when you're in a rack environment and you want to use the in-memory column store. In a rack environment, when you mark a table for in-memory, that table is going to be automatically distributed among the rack nodes. What does that mean? It means that we'll place a piece of that table into each of the rack nodes in the rack cluster. When a query comes in that needs to access that table, we'll send a different process out to each of the rack nodes. It'll execute the query on its piece of the table and return the results to a coordinator who will aggregate the results and return them to you, the end user. Now, how we distribute the data across the cluster is, can be done automatically or you can decide to do it yourself. So how do you control how a table is distributed among the rack nodes in a rack cluster? Well, you can do it by specifying the distribute attribute as part of the in-memory attribute when you're deciding which objects can be populated into the column store. You can either just specify distribute, which will mean Oracle will automatically pick the best type of distribution for your object, or you can specify the distribution technique either by partition or by row ID range. Distribute by partition means that Oracle will place a different partition on each of the rack nodes in the rack cluster. Or by row ID range, which means that we'll hash each of the row ID ranges and put an even amount of rows on each of the rack nodes in the rack cluster. So what happens if I can't fit all of the data into the in-memory column store? Can I still benefit from accessing some of the data from the column store? And the answer to that is yes. It doesn't matter if you can't fit all of the data in the column store. Let's say we've got the latest partition of our table, the one that's most performance sensitive in the column store. The rest of the table resides either on flash or on disk. A query comes in now and it wants to access all of the partitions in the table. What's going to happen? Well, the optimizer and the database is fully aware of what data resides where. And so we're going to pick the best access path to pick up that data. So it may be scanning the latest partition from the column store and then using an index to pick up the rest of the data from the disk if that's the best access path for it. How do you know this is going on? Well, you're going to look in the execution plan. In this plan, you'll see there that just one partition, partition 16 of the sales table, was accessed from the column store. I know it was because we used table access in memory full as the access path for that. The rest of the partitions in the table, though, were accessed via an index because those partitions reside on disk, and that index was the fastest way to go after that data. Now, I didn't need to know that. The optimizer automatically rewrote my query as a union all, allowing me to have a different execution path for both branches of that union all query. What about keeping the data in the in-memory column store fault tolerant? You have the ability to mirror the data within the in-memory column stores in a rack environment. 
This means that there'll be a second copy of all of the data populated into the column store in one of the other rack nodes. Should a rack node go down, we're not going to have any impact in performance of our queries because we'll simply read the mirrored copy of the data that's already in memory on one of the other rack nodes. You can control this duplication by using the duplicate attribute as part of your in-memory attribute. You've got two choices. Simply specifying in-memory distribute means that you'll get one additional copy of the data in the in-memory column stores across the rack cluster. If you want complete fault tolerance, in other words, you want a complete copy of all of the objects in all of the in-memory column stores across the rack cluster, you can do so by specifying distribute all. That will give you a unique copy of each object in each of the column stores across the rack cluster. Thank you for joining me for this session on Oracle Database in-memory option.